What about the, you know, the sixth sense, you know? Does the Western medicine teach anything about the sixth sense? How about the seventh sense, you know? How about the eighth sense? How about the ninth sense, you know? And I could read your body like a farmer could read the land and the weather. And that is what I do. The more that I can know about myself, the more that I can know about many kinds of healing, the more I can help my patients. From all over the United States, patients come to this building at UCLA Medical Center in search of relief from debilitating stomach pains, colitis, and other chronic gastrointestinal diseases. But what they find here is never quite what they expect. Okay, here we go. Doctors here realized their Western training was often useless in treating this group of diseases. In a bold move which has the potential to revolutionize medicine as we know it, they decided to bring in practitioners from ancient healing traditions to solve problems they were stymied by. Dr. Emrin Mayer runs the clinic. Uh, so if something has stayed around relatively unchanged over three, five thousand years, uh, you know, just intuitively you would say there must be something to that, otherwise it couldn't have survived. One of the first people they brought in was Dr. Pertinen Awasti, a surgeon from the University of Bombay, trained both in Western medicine and the 5,000-year-old Ayurvedic healing traditions of his country. His first patient, Diane, had suffered from debilitating bouts of ulcerative colitis. Oh, I can't do anything. I mean, I am just, I'm bedridden. Um, if it's a severe attack, um, I can't go out of the house. After 16 years of suffering from the disease, Diane was frustrated by her lack of progress and feeling the effects of the drugs she'd been on for years. The type of drugs that they are, I can see changes in my body. I can see the effects on my body because of the, the long-term um, use of the drugs, which is why I was interested in finding an alternative. You know, I feel like I'm still feeling the after effects of all the high doses of steroids and even... Working with the team of UCLA physicians, Dr. Awasti's job was to use his skills to probe for things their Western-trained eyes might have missed. Menstrual cycles, diet, lifestyle, or past family trauma might give him insight into treatment. I have told you are suffering since you were 17. Mm -hmm. At yeah. that time, anything very serious happened in your life? I have been an insomniac since I was about 13, so I'm a worrier by nature. Any backache? A lot of times the backache will go along with, um, with lack of sleep and fatigue, and all those things that, that kind of, um, that can trigger an attack. I think except about your motion and getting the cramps in the abdomen, you don't have any other trouble. I have a um, problem with pyoderma gangrenosum, gangrenosum, or I have in the past. It's an ulcer that I got on my leg which is related to ulcerative colitis. What they told me is that what I saw on my leg happen is what happens in my gut when the disease is active. Sometimes as a, as a patient, you kind of wonder if you're becoming a hypochondriac because there are so many things that seem to ache and you just wonder if maybe you're being hypersensitive and you're a little reluctant to bring it up to a doctor, at least I am. He seemed to be more interested on, in, every, in the whole body rather than just the gut. It seems that Eastern practitioners are trained um, to see things such as the appearance of, this, of the tongue, the skin, color of the skin, um, feeling of the pulse, that we have not been trained with our senses to, uh, to detect a diet, what sort of diet you actually you take? Chicken, I eat a lot of chicken. <laughs> eat a lot of chicken? Yeah, and oh. chicken and fish. In Western medicine, diet is, a, is a, an issue that we poorly understand. We, it's poorly studied. There are many myths around it, probably more than about anything else in medicine. Food contains a lot more than just the nutrients. It contains molecules that are very similar, for example, to the endorphins. It contains food that are very similar to other molecules that the body and the brain uses as chemical messengers. The way you would treat it or your recommendation would be to use... The recommendations um, first will be about your diet. Diet? Diet. Uh -huh. I mean the vegetarian diet. And I'm just wondering what specifically... No, the meat portion you have to cut off. 
could well be that this ancient tradition has identified these certain foods based on their qualities, which might correlate really to their different contents of these chemical messengers, which will have profound influences on, you know, pain, uh, secretion, inflammation, immune function. Wherever we depart or we meet, understand, we do like this namaste. Despite his expertise in both disciplines, Dr. Awasti chose a purely Ayurvedic approach for Diane, recommending traditional herbs and medicinal enemas for her treatment. So whatever God is there in you, the God in you, I nama means I bow. The patient has to respect the doctor, doctor has to respect the patient. And it is best approach and the best justice is done when doctor feels that who has come to me as a patient is nothing else but myself. Dr. Gail Randall is one of the doctors designing the experimental program at UCLA. As she's learned more about both Native American and Oriental healing practices, she's been able to help patients like Michelle, who'd been ill for two years. I had sort of reached a point uh, of extreme pain. Uh, I was having migraines, sort of related to the sense of nausea, the pain. Couldn't stop vomiting, and I was a real basket case. She'd actually had a workup before and seen some other physicians, Western physicians. Um, they had done a right upper quadrant ultrasound and some blood tests and didn't find anything wrong. She'd also been tried on a bunch of medications, none of which worked. I had, you know, really run out of things that I could do. I thought it would be good if she could see uh, Dr. Hirano. In Chinese medicine, one of the first things we look at is the spirit. I try to only let the body speak to me. And I try to listen very intently. Her pulse told me that she was in pain, but it didn't show stagnant blood pulse symptoms. Her abdomen, I was able to palpate deeply. I didn't detect any swelling. One thing that physically happened was that she had uh, back pain. And then I turned her over, and I found uh, several things there that was interesting. Her spinal alignment was not straight. And so I, I did a little manipulation there to see if this is the key for her. It was very interesting because, uh, for one, this was around her heart center, her emotional center, and the center where uh, um, one's ideas and plans, plans for the future would be associated with that area of her spine. She had this issue with work. She'd been unemployed for two years, and that's about the length of her symptoms, and they were getting worse and worse. And in addition to that, she was worried that even if she did get a job, she wouldn't be able to carry it out because of her symptoms. So it was sort of a vicious circle. A spine going out of place is not so mechanical. It reflects an energetic configuration of the mind, body, and spirit, meaning that what you are going through in your life is shaping you. And then she came forth to me with another bit of history that she had had a trauma in the past. And it was a fairly significant thing and maybe it was actually unresolved. I mean, I am a, a rape victim twice. Uh, and I don't know yet if I've worked all of that out. I'm, you know, and I have my father who's dying of Alzheimer's and, you know, we all have our stress. We're finding a lot of association between past traumas, unresolved issues with people, and symptoms, particularly gastroenterologic, particularly people with functional bowel disease. Because of what was occurring in her life, through her experience, and what her mind and emotions and spirituality, those dispositions dictated or influenced which vertebrae is going to be stable and which vertebrae is going to move. At that point, then, I knew where to concentrate and decided to treat her front from her back. If he could balance out her energies, relieve her pain, it would relieve her stress, and then she would be able to open up more and we'd be able to deal with what's actually going on with her. 
I, you know, your back is out of alignment. There's a vertebrae that's out. So the pain you feel, the, the queasiness, the, all the, the instability related to your stomach is really from your back. And as I say, in that first treatment, I was like immediately better. Well, the follow-up was phenomenal. She said she was 85% improved. She had only a mild ache here in the right upper quadrant. No severe pain, no severe vomiting episodes, no nausea, and no headaches, no migraine headaches. And she was having two or three of those a week. So she really had excellent results. And she got a job. So <laughs> she's, things are happening for her. She is healing all around. Such treatments as acupuncture, diet, and massage may help stabilize and improve patients. But doctors here have repeatedly found that past traumas and other psychological problems are at the heart of these diseases. To deal with this, they bring in a special kind of help. My name is George Amiot. I'm an Ogallala Lakota. I kind of branched off from internal medicine, pediatrics. I wanted to do something constructive for my own people. So in learning Western medicine, I also studied Native American medicine. My elders, they were the individuals that had knowledge sacred knowledge that their grandfather spoke of. They were the dream keepers. They were the individuals that kept alive the songs, the sacred ceremonies. It was my responsibility as a citizen of that nation, as a young man of that nation, as a warrior of that nation, to keep those things alive. When Dr. Mayer brought George into the program, his first patient was David, who had repeatedly been hospitalized with a bleeding ulcer in his colon complicated drug therapy wasn't working and his last option before surgery was George. I, I mean I, I had no idea. I didn't know whether it was going to be uh, a, some kind of a ritual or you know uh, George holding chicken bones over me or uh, chicken feathers or you know what was going on. There are times when uh, you know something will happen or I'll see something or, or hear, hear a particular song or whatever and like that whole thing will come rushing back you know. Uh, all those emotions would come around, you know, come back. Every July, he would uh, come down with some abdomen problems. He would uh, lose sleep, lose weight, lose motivation. And there was an anniversary behind this. Um, the anniversary was he'd come home one day and found his, his uh, mate shot herself, committed suicide. She was still alive but he watched her cross the river. And that definitely did something to him. I think that would probably definitely do something to anyone. Well, Tala and I had been together for about uh, 10 years. And uh, she had gotten uh, kind of really depressed at some point. Uh, and um, we were having some problems, uh, you know, in the relationship also. But uh, she got really uh, at a point where she had to be hospitalized. and. Uh, uh, for a couple of weeks, and then uh, after she, they couldn't hold her for longer than that, or, or whatever legally. So uh, the day she got out of the hospital, she had already purchased a gun and uh, and committed suicide in, uh, in our apartment. Knowing that George had a big background in dealing with post-traumatic stress disorders, I, I felt that this might be a very good match with identifying and then actually resolving the, the, the trigger for this anniversary. I was fearful in a number of aspects that um, he would take his own life because at that time he was um, still punishing himself for what had happened. Even though he didn't pull the trigger, he did pull the trigger in his mind. I told him about my experience as a Marine in Vietnam, the things that the pain, the agonies, the, the grief, and how I handled that. And I told him about the importance of ceremony, whether it be done by a medicine man, whether it be done by a priest, or whether it's been done by yourself, himself. But I said, a ceremony's got to be done. Ceremony's got to be done in your mind. A ceremony's got to be done here on the earth to relieve the, the pain. You've got to forgive yourself. In the course of talking, David revealed that he had kept most of his fiancée's possessions prominently displayed in his apartment for over 10 years. Included in a small box was her suicide note. And there was a real desire to, uh, to do that ritual, 
uh, in the pan and, the, right. and do a whole ceremony about it to, to let that go, to burn it and let it go. And I still haven't done that particular thing, that particular act. Only in, in my head I've done it, but I haven't physically done it. He was very much aware of the connection of his illness, of his recurrence uh, with the anniversary. He still had not made the final step of actually burning the centerpiece of that, of that unhealthy ritual. I told him that the past would never be forgotten, that incident would never be forgotten, but it had to be taken and put in a very special, sacred place within his heart and his mind, because if he didn't do it, then his body was going to continue to react to that environment, that situation, and that one of these days he would have to make that journey and go back to the happening, that time, make that journey to the past and forgive himself. I mean, the ultimate proof of this, of the success of this is obviously if he's going to go through this anniversary date without the recurrence, um, which I couldn't tell you at this point. But I, I think his case illustrated in a very dramatic way how the medical system basically bypassed an uh, essential component of his disease process. I mean, it, it was never addressed by either resident or by previous attendings who were also specialists in gastroenterology. One final note. It's been two weeks since the anniversary of Marthella's death, and for the first time in years, David has not been hospitalized. The week before the anniversary, he burned the suicide letter on a full moon. It's where I come from and what's been taught to me as a practitioner. That's holy work. That's sacred work. I feel that it really rounds out what we can offer these people. It allows us more tools, and it makes us really complete when we work together. The physicians of the different health sciences really need each other. We need this combined mind, combined therapies, these modalities open to, to bring the best of all worlds to the patient. I feel like this is the seed being planted for medicine of the year 2000.